So this is the finale of our series, Prove It. And I'm really excited for this finale, but I also understand that some of you may not have been here for the whole series. This may even be your first week. So my name is Todd, and I'm really honored that you would join us. And if you want to go back and catch up, you can do it through our podcast or our YouTube channel. And I also want to take a moment and just get us all on the same page by reminding us of the premise of the series. The premise is simply this. Most if not all of us, want to live a prove-it lifestyle. We want to make sure that our words and actions align and remove any discrepancy between the two. And I also want to take us back to a question that helped inspire this series. It was a question that was asked by Jake Stum, who's with us today, when I was in college. Jake asked this question over a decade ago, but it stuck with me, and he said some version of this. If our church ceased to exist, would the community miss us? I was in college, I'm like, that's really good. Say that slower one more time. I need to let that soak in for a minute. If our church ceased to exist, would the community miss us? And not miss us because suddenly 17th Street is free of traffic on Sundays, but like miss the tangible ways that we're impacting our community. The fact is we come into this gathering and we sing songs about Jesus, you change everything. We dig into the word about Jesus changing us from the inside out. But if we sing about that, if we say these things, if we study these things in this room and we fail to walk out and live as people who are being changed by Jesus, then we're not living a prove it lifestyle. If the impact that happens in this room is limited to this room, and if we fail to go out and impact our community, then there's some discrepancy between what we say and what we do. So this is a huge question. As I thought about it, here's a version of the question that really fits our series. How do we become love displayed to our community? And that wording comes from the fact that our phrase for the year, and if you haven't gotten one of these cards or still at the info hub, pick them up, but love defined, love described, and love displayed. And on the back is our scriptures. Jesus' definition of love. Paul, who wrote 1 Corinthians, his description of it. And then what's our role? Our role is to become love displayed. And here's how, why that matters as it pertains to our community. Look with me at verse 35. In verse 35, Jesus said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. See, when we love like Jesus, we prove that we are with Jesus and we point people to Jesus. When we love like Jesus, we prove that we are with him and we point others to him. So it's vital that we become love displayed to our community so that they can see how Jesus is changing us and through our love, we can invite them to let Jesus change them as well. So a couple of answers to this question. How do we become love displayed? Some things that we are fired up about that are going on. One is the International Friends Network or IFN meets every Saturday in the Annex and hosts Conversation Corner. And here's what that's about. It's an environment where we welcome and love the internationals that are moving into our community and give them a place to practice their English. Isn't that incredible? And there's relationships that flow out of that foundation of Conversation Corner. And one of the highlights of this series for me was that during part three, a guy came up to me and was like, hey, I did something like IFN back home. I wanna do it again. I called the Gordons who lead IFN and they were already on Key Street. They just turned around like, we gotta meet this guy. Let's get him serving. That he's wanting to live a prove it lifestyle. And that young man wanted to make sure that along with everyone serving with IFN, that we are becoming love displayed to our international friends. Another way that we answer that question is through a partnership with Willow Bend Farms. If you don't know about Willow Bend Farms, they are phenomenal. They are working to end human trafficking in our city. They're shining the light of Jesus into some really dark places, offering freedom to ladies and even men who've been oppressed for far too long. We love the little ways that we get to come alongside them. So we have some answers, but what we did is we wanted to live out our culture of refining and we wanted to dig deeper and go, okay, is, is there something else that you want us to do? Is there a way that you want us to refine as we think about how we become love displayed to our community? And there were two big ways that the Holy Spirit led us to refine. First, he's invited us to zoom out from a one-year outlook to a five-year perspective. That instead of just thinking about how we can maximize our bandwidth and our impact in 2020, let's think about how we can maximize our bandwidth and impact from 2020 through 2024. The other part of that is just to remind us that if we aim for everything, it's likely we'll hit nothing. 
So we can't aim for everything, but we need to focus. So some of you may have been here in November as we did a survey of our, of our gatherings to say, what are some areas of the city that our church is passionate about digging some deep roots in? Not doing everything, but aiming for one thing, a few very important partnerships with people in specific areas of our community. So all of this refining led us to sit across from the table, Katie, our executive assistant, and I sat across the table from the leaders of City Fields. City Fields is a community development organization, and here's what they do. They wanna be a catalyst for change in overlooked neighborhoods. And as we sat down with City Fields to talk about what would a five-year partnership look like, here's what we began to understand, that their DNA and our DNA lines up. And we begin to see that all our partnerships are actually gonna get better from diving in to a partnership with City Fields. So Jake Stum is a great friend. He is the leader of the Mission Church in Cleveland, the Mission uh, Chapel in Cleveland. And he's also the director of strategy development City Fields. So we're gonna watch a video to let us know a little bit more about them. And then Jake's gonna come out and tell us more about their work. So check this out. Cultivating healthy neighborhoods is a bit complicated. But at City Fields, we've managed to simplify things by focusing on five key areas. We call these areas our fields. All of these work together to make healthier communities. Yes, we do build neighborhood parks, community gardens, build new homes, and we even repair old homes. We do this not just to improve an area, we do it to improve lives by creating places that are safe, self-sufficient, and more energy efficient. Safety starts at home and between neighbors. We work to build healthy relationships over the fences and across the street, looking out for each other, which builds trust. Additionally, creating lasting partnerships with local law enforcement creates confidence and comfort. A good job affects everything. That's why we assist residents in securing better employment opportunities. We do this through a job readiness program to help connect job ready candidates to viable employment opportunities. City Fields partners with residents and local partners to bring the community together. Through organized events, we promote community involvement to strengthen the social structure and spirit of collaboration within the neighborhood. Empower residents and identify goals for their community. Ultimately, we're assisting the neighborhood leaders by addressing community issues, collecting their input on all projects, helping to mobilize residents, and working with them to plan community events, physical revitalization projects, and more. All these areas work together, making healthier communities. City Fields, reimagining communities of the past for a healthy tomorrow. So you guys give it up for Jake Stum. Thank you all. Thank you all. I've, I learned in the first two services with face recognition, if you leave your phone like this, you keep having to... <laughs> and everybody thought there was something wrong with me. So I'm going to hold my phone up this time. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I'm so proud of Public Church. I'm so proud of Todd, and we go way back. It's hard to believe it's over a decade. Uh, and you remembered a question I asked. Oh, they might impact. Have. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> uh, so in City Fields, we are a place-based, holistic, resident-informed community development corporation. Everybody got that? Uh, but just basically what that means, we're place-based, meaning that we focus on one area at a time. And our place right now is only about a mile long and a mile wide. So we hope to go a mile deep and an inch wide uh, in that area. Uh, technically, it kind of overlaps with a census tract in town that's one of the most low-income census tracts. And an interesting stat, kind of a sad stat, is USA Today pulled uh, census tracts from low-income areas around the nation, and they measured from 2008 to 2016 which census tracts increased in disparity as compared to the rest of the county they were in. So in that time frame, when disparity grew, grew with poverty, but the county around it grew in prosperity, what were the most despairingly... We'll go with it. Yeah, we'll like go it. with it. Where was the most disparity? And our census tract was number nine in the country uh, for that and number one in the state of Tennessee. So we have a lot of work to do. Historically, it's a wonderful neighborhood that just experienced some disinvestment over the last couple of decades and it's been overlooked, and we want to partner with residents uh, to bring about a holistic change. So we've been around for about seven years. The first year was pretty much entirely listening and had a posture of listening to residents, and that's where we came up with the five fields that you just saw. And we have goals in every field 
And uh, however long it takes, it could be five more years or ten more years that we're there. Once we reach those goals, we'll start over in a new place. Uh, and our mentor organization has been around 40 years, and they're on their third neighborhood. So that's the kind of impact and change that we want to see. And uh, the best example I can give of how we all work together is um, we, we were able to, through a grant, hire an urban designer to come and do a master plan for our neighborhood. So he spent a week uh, meeting with residents, met with about 300 residents of our neighborhood. And through those meetings and some meetings with some city people, Greg Thomas is here, city on our board of directors. Way to go, Greg. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know Greg, you should. He's an awesome person. Right. Anyway, um, residents started, this was not an idea that we had at all. So in meetings, we knew that a grocery store would come up because we're in a food desert and residents are desperate for affordable groceries. But through listening, parents kept saying this thing about, we want our kids to be able to get to school to Blythe Bower safely. Uh, because there were no proper sidewalks, not proper lighting. There wasn't a safe way, if you know the neighborhood, how to get over to Blythe Bower from our neighborhood. So surprisingly to us, this kept coming up over and over again. So we were able to take this, the resident's idea and take it to the city and to other funding partners and say, what if we did this? How, how could this work? And it doesn't always work this great. But in this situation, in a short period of time, we were able to gather up close to a million dollars in funding and there's already the first phase of this safe path to school right down the middle of our neighborhood that in two years from now will dump kids out straight in the front door of Blythe Bower Elementary School. That's awesome. And uh, it's just really cool how... Did somebody clap? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you're, Matt's the first clapper of all three services. <laughs> yes. Sidewalks matter. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> So we, we're just so excited about this partnership, and, and you'll hear Todd talk. He, the way he talks about you all entering into this has been a lot of time together, uh, and um, we do share a very similar DNA. So I am Anglican, and Anglicans, we like to bless everything, uh, and I'd like to bless you and bless Public Church this morning. So Public Church, may you be poured out, just as Jesus was broken and poured out. May we remember him well by allowing ourselves to be broken and poured out. May we heal wounds, may we unite what has fallen apart, and may we bring home those who have lost their way. Amen. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Thank you, Jake. Give it up for him one more time. Love you, man. Thank you. It's awesome. So I just want to address something that's probably happening, happening in most of our souls at this point. And that's the fact that for those of us who follow Jesus, there's something inside of us that as he was speaking that's going, yes, yes, yes. That's exactly what the church should be doing. Like, that is awesome. And the reality is for those of you who don't follow Jesus, you probably had a similar feeling of going, yes, if I chose to follow Jesus, if I was going to be a part of a church, I would want to be a part of serving like City Fields. That's it. So what is it about their approach to serving? It just resonates with our souls because it's actually a very biblical approach. And what we're going to discover today is actually woven into our DNA as well. That's why all of our partnerships will improve through working with City Fields. So before we dive into our specific role with them as we start this, we need to say, hey, how do we articulate that mindset that we're all going, oh, that's amazing. How do we articulate that in a way that we can live it out better than we ever have before. So to help us articulate that mindset, we're going to go on a journey through a few different scriptures. We're going to begin in James chapter 2, a, a place that we were at in week 2 of the series. And in James 2 verses 15 and 16, James writes, suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? We read this in week 2. And look, we know that this is true, that it doesn't do us any good if we're to walk out of the 12 and see someone in need and say, bless you. I hope somebody else provides for you. Let me pray for you. That doesn't do any good. That's why James writes in verse 17, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. And we talked about this in week two, that faith and action are intertwined and inseparable. If we say that we love Jesus, yet fail to tangibly love the people he loves, then are we really loving Jesus? Oh, and by the way, there are no loopholes in the phrase, the people he loves. He died for everyone. He created 
everyone. We are all made in the image of God. So there's really no way around this. And so this verse is great, and it motivates us to action. The problem is we sometimes act in ways that don't live out the full um, direction of Scripture. Here's what I mean by that. So we read this, and we come across somebody that's in need, and we come up to them with this kind of attitude. <laughs> you should probably take a moment and just break out in a praise and worship song because I have arrived to help you. Like I can tell by looking at you and thinking about what I look like that you are pretty much incapable of doing anything to get yourself out of this terrible situation you've put yourself in. But praise Jesus, he brought me. And I am filled with the love of Jesus filled with the kindness of Jesus. I have more money than you, and so let me reach down because otherwise you poor, pitiful creature are just helpless. Man, I say that, but I know I've served like that, and I don't think I'm alone. So the problem is that we sometimes live out James chapter two in a way that conflicts with James chapter three, verse 13, where he writes this. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it. It's our series title, prove it. By living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Can we all say humility together? Ready? Humility. And then last week, we looked at Galatians 5.13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another, what's that word? Humbly in love. So there's got to be a way to live in the tension that scripture creates, that we can serve people, but not do it out of arrogance, not do it in a way that makes them appear undignified, but that we, there's gotta be a way to serve people in humility. That's what City Field is doing. That's why it resonates with us, and it's woven into who we are as well. So we're gonna look at an anchor passage today, not just for today, but for the next five years and maybe even beyond as we think about how we serve. That anchor passage is 2 Corinthians chapter eight and nine. And we'll be in it from time to time as we revisit this because it's gonna show us the approach that we need to have to serve. It's gonna articulate the mindset that we all are longing for but can't quite put words to. So chapter eight, verse one, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. So we think about a biblical mindset for serving. It starts with God's grace. Because here's the reality. For those of us who follow Jesus, the only way, the only reason we can follow him is because of his grace. God's grace initiates and sustains our relationship with him. It's only because he offers an unearned invitation to follow him. But here's the thing about grace. It's not just meant for us. Grace poured out in us must become grace poured out through us. God pours grace into us so they can overflow into others. How is that happening in the Macedonian churches? Paul tells us in verse two. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For our math people in the house, there is a math equation here. Here's what it's saying. It says they have a severe trial plus extreme poverty equals overflowing joy and rich generosity. This is crazy. This is not what we expect. We would expect to read, they had a month where they got a bonus at work, and that bonus in excess overflowed into a tremendous, okay, maybe a little bit of generosity. Isn't that how we live a lot of times? When God blesses me with more, okay, now I can give and be generous. And she, No, these guys, like in the original language, they're literally in the depths of poverty, severe affliction, yet they're overflowing with joy, and they're giving generously but not just generously, the, the, the phrase is, is wealth of generosity, which basically means it's the highest level of generosity you can get to. It gets even crazier in verse three and four. It says this, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. It says they didn't just give from their means, they gave beyond their own ability because they're in the depths of poverty. And then a commentary I looked at said that we could interpret that phrase entirely on their own as spontaneous. 
Nobody had to stand up and say, hey, let's give to the church in Jerusalem, which is who they were giving to. They're in need. No, they just felt compelled, inspired, motivated by the Holy Spirit to do it. And they said, it doesn't matter that we're in abject poverty. We're going to have an abundance of generosity. Wow. That's amazing. I think the message paraphrase captures what's going on really well. It says, fierce trouble came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy, happy, though desperately poor. The pressure triggered something totally unexpected, an outpouring of pure and generous gifts. I was there and saw it for myself. They gave offerings of whatever they could, far more than they could afford, pleading for the privilege of helping out in relief of poor Christians, which is ironic because they are also poor Christians. This is crazy. Here's what it would be like. It would be like if we had showed up at the 12 today and we have an opportunity to give, that people would be like, yes, woo, I've been waiting. And not waiting because I have more, waiting because it doesn't matter what I have, I want to give, come on, I'm excited for this time. Let's try it. (laughs) That's what's happening in the Macedonian church. Why is this happening? Because there's a word in verse four that shows their mindset. It's translated in this version as sharing. In Greek, it's the word koinonia. Here's what it means. It implies overtones of partnership. Here's what fired up the Macedonian church. They understood that all of their generosity was placing them in partnerships with people who were spreading the gospel, the story of Jesus that changes everything. And so they were literally able to partner not only with what God was doing in their own churches, but with churches all over the world through their generosity. So if you have to leave early or you just get bored and start scrolling on Instagram, this is the mindset for how we serve. And we're gonna keep coming back to this statement over the next five years. The statement is this, we serve through partnerships built on reciprocal generosity and fueled by listening and learning. We serve through partnerships built on reciprocal generosity and fueled by listening and learning. So first, let's think about that idea of generosity. Generosity as fueling partnerships. We have a huge praise for us as a church because in 2018, we were able to generously give away $130,000. That's money given to us and then through us to others. And most of that money was given out through partnerships. But guess what? In 2019, we had a $15,000 increase. We were able to give away $145,000. Is that not amazing? That's a partnership in the gospel. Yes, that is good news. The Macedonian church got this. They're like, man, that's literally contributing to people following Jesus, and it's creating true life change. Here's the evidence. We have a partnership with the Greenhouse Church in Athens. They're almost two years old. In fact, we got to help start it. A lot of their leadership came from here. Their lead pastor, Todd Humbert, and his wife, Michelle, they were both part of our team here and had huge roles. And some of you ladies, if you were at Galentine's, which was phenomenal last week, you may have seen Michelle and a whole crew of ladies from the greenhouse because Jen Han, the speaker, was her, her sister. And so we just love opportunities to partner. And one of the ways we get to partner is through a financial element of that partnership. So here's what that means. On January 13th of this year, Todd Humbert went full time. Now, I know not everybody's like, oh my God, yeah, full time. Here's why that matters, okay? Because prior to that, Todd was working a 40 plus hour job and launching a brand new church, which is also a full time job. So he had two full time jobs with a wife and with four children. You know what we call that? Unsustainable. We call that a situation where Todd is awesome. He's a great dad, a great husband, but there's a limit to the level of husband and dad he can be because of time restraints placed on him by having two full-time jobs. And through our generosity on January 13th, he got to become full-time way sooner than they, he would have been able to do that without us. Is that not phenomenal? And so here's what that means. Of course it means that the church is gonna be more effective because he can devote his time to it. Of course, duh. But the real impact is in the echo that's gonna be felt on his relationship with his kids growing up. The extra time that he's gonna be able to spend with Michelle and with his kids because we got to partner with the greenhouse in sharing the gospel through our generosity. And so know this. Every time we're thinking generosity, we always have people in mind. 
So consider our Beyond Project, which I know some people are like, well, you're building. What's that have to do with people? Well, the vision is to create spaces where Jesus impacts people beyond the room. So as we contribute to the Beyond Project, here's what we are doing. We're partnering with people that we may not have ever even met. People that maybe three years from now, somebody in this gathering will meet and will invite them to a gathering and they will walk in and they will find themselves a seat and they will encounter Jesus and their life on earth and the eternity after earth will be forever changed. And our generosity today is partnering with future life change years from now. Is that not amazing? I mean, that's awesome. And not only that, but as we've begun fundraising for a Beyond Project, last year we gave away $10,000. So we're not just raising money for a building, we gave away more than we ever have, 5,000 to Willowbend Farms to fight human trafficking in our area, 5,000 to the Nightingale Foundation in Romania to fight human trafficking globally. Generosity always has a view of people. So we serve through partnerships built on reciprocal generosity. But let's back up, why why partnerships? Because one of our core values says, and I don't think City Fields has this articulated like this, but they could. It could be their core value too. It says this, we come alongside, we, excuse me, we serve by come alongside people rather than completing projects. So, so what's the difference in doing projects versus coming alongside people? See, when you do a project, it's completed quickly. Usually one day, people, there's ongoing relationship with checkpoints. Projects, They're one way. It's all about how we can help those poor people who cannot help themselves, whereas people, it's two-way. It's reciprocal. Projects are task-oriented. Let's just get this done in one day so we can go, man, public church is awesome. Look at what we did. People, it's relationship-driven. Projects elevate our name. Look at all we did in this short amount of time. We checked off this list, and we're changing people. People, it points to Jesus. Because ultimately... (laughs) At the ground level, projects devalue and dehumanize, whereas coming alongside people points us all back to the image of God within us. What do I mean? We treat somebody like a project, just something to be completed. No, something, not someone. Something to be completed. Something that can't do anything for itself. I'm using these non-human terms on purpose. We're dehumanizing them. But when we come alongside people in partnerships, You know what we're acknowledging? We're acknowledging that the image of God is in them just like it's in us, and we both have something to bring to the table. And that's where we get to reciprocal generosity. Not one-way generosity where, man, you should be so glad I showed up because I have what you need and I'm awesome. Reciprocal generosity. Even with people who may be in the depths of poverty because they could be like the Macedonian church who says, we're still gonna give beyond our means, even though all of you guys would say, we don't even have any means. (laughs) That we give people space to give as well. Here's what that looks like in our partnership with our Romanian church, Battelle Baptist. It looks like the fact that as we're going there, March 5th through 13th, guess who's planned the trip? They have. Guess who's telling us what to do and has made the activity schedule? They have. Because who has no idea how to do ministry in Chernovoda? Who knows how to do ministry in Chernovoda, Romania? They do, they live there. So we're not rolling in as Americans going, (laughs) glad we can save you guys for eight days. No, we're rolling in saying, man, we are honored to be a part of the work that God is doing here. And he was doing it before we showed up. He's gonna be doing it long after we're gone. So what do you want us to do? Not only that, but our reciprocal generosity went to a, a new level. Whitney, my wife, and Katie, our executive assistant, they've been planning logistics of the trip with Ben Wells, who's been working on the Romanian Inn. And Ben let us know that the Romanian church is covering all of our on-ground costs. Can we praise Jesus for that? Is that not awesome? (laughs) So we get there, and their church said, reciprocal generosity, partnership, we're covering all of the on-ground costs. And you know what we didn't say? Nope, we're Americans. We're gonna do that. No, we said, thank you. That's awesome. Like, we want to give them space to give because here's the thing. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive, and sometimes we want to hoard all the blessings. We want to be the ones giving and giving and giving, but then someone wants to give to us, and we have an opportunity to receive so that they can be blessed. We're like, no, no, I'm too good to receive. Reciprocal generosity. We celebrate when we get to give, 
and we celebrate when others get to give as well. In fact, Paul nails this in chapter eight, verse 14. He says this, at the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. So in turn, there's plenty will supply what you need. Do you see that? That hey, right now, the Macedonian church, they are giving to the Jerusalem church because the Jerusalem church is in need. But there will come a day when the Jerusalem church will give back to the Macedonian church. Reciprocal generosity. That's a true partnership. And you know what we have to do in order to, to enter into reciprocal generosity? We've gotta expand our definition of generosity of course it's money, but it's not just money, it's money, it's time, and it's ability, and we have to understand that as we enter a relationship with someone, sure, we may have more than them in one of these areas, but it's very likely they have more than us in one of the other areas as well. So we give people space to give. We are generous, and we provide room for them to be generous as well. There is no one-way generosity in God's kingdom because that strips people of their dignity. So as we enter into conversations with people, as we serve, we're not just walking in going, man, you should be so glad I'm here. We're walking in going, man, I'm humbled to learn from you as well. Let, let's just take our abilities, our time, our let's put it all on the table and let's see how we can serve each other. Reciprocal generosity. And I love that if you were to read this whole passage, I know we're skipping around some. This is gonna be an anchor point that we'll come back to. But you know the word that's used quite often to describe generosity? Grace. The phrase is act of grace. Because when it comes to the motivation for why we are generous, the motivation for why we serve, Paul levels the playing field. He says, if you're gonna follow Jesus, here's the motivation for every single person, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, the level playing field is for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So as we read this, I got to let you know I've made an assumption that I've operated on throughout this whole talk, so I'm just going to put it out there. The assumption is this, that if you choose to follow Jesus, you're generous, or you're wanting to grow in generosity. Because there's no version of following Jesus that negates generosity. And if you're sitting here going, I follow Jesus, but I don't want to be generous. Hey, that's not my issue. I, I can't talk you into that. Because here's the thing about generosity. Generosity is inspired by Jesus and triggered by grace. Serving's the same way. Serving, generosity, inspired by Jesus, triggered by grace. So what makes us generous? when we truly begin to understand that Jesus left heaven, the unimaginable riches of heaven, and he came here. And if it, that's not enough, he was born in a barn for crying out loud, not Erlinger East, a cradle in the dirt, as we're gonna sing about in a little bit. That he didn't, he wasn't born into this royal family. He didn't have more than everybody else around him. And why did he do that? So we could be rich, not have lots of money, spiritually rich. So we could have a relationship with God that we desperately need, but in no way deserve. So the motivation, <laughs> the starting ground for generosity, mm, level. It's the cross of Jesus and the generosity he displayed towards us. And so we'll end with verse 13 of chapter nine. Chapter nine, verse 13 really the verse that started this whole talk, for me at least, and as I was studying, it says, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. This is an incredible verse. Here's what it's saying. <laughs> You've proved yourselves by your generosity. In other words, generosity proves the authenticity of our love. That generosity proves the authenticity of our love. Generosity allows us to, that word sharing is the Greek word koinonia again. Generosity allows us to partner with people in the gospel. So we prove it by our generosity and then we give people space to prove it by their generosity. 
we don't hoard the blessings. Yes, we're gonna prove it by our generosity and we're gonna partner with people. But you know what? That partnership is two-way and we're gonna give them space to also prove it by their generosity as the Holy Spirit leads them. This is the DNA of City Fields that we all were drawn to. This is the DNA of public church. This is how the Bible tells us that we should serve. So, so what's our role with City Fields, at least starting out? There's gonna be a few dates on the screen. I invite you to take a picture of this or just to, to write it down. But our role is that last part of how we serve, which is fueled by listening and learning. Our role is to show up. Maybe we show up on the last Monday of the month at the Blythe Oldfield Community Association. Pick a month and show up at 6 p.m. and witness and see a resonant-led movement. And just keep your great ideas to yourself because honestly, they have better ideas. They live there. And let's just listen and learn. And then on March 17th, we're not asking them to come to us. We're going to them. And Jake and some residents are gonna take some time to invite us to come into their neighborhood as they just present their philosophy and share how they're doing things. That's another chance for us just to listen and learn. And by the way, we're asking all community groups to take one of their regular meetings and go to one of these. So as many of us as possible can just see what God is doing through City Fields. And then finally, if you love to garden, March 28th, they need some help getting their gardens going. But for crying out loud, please do not show up as the, the teacher of all things gardening. And oh, let me tell you to plant. No, no, we just show up. And we say, how do you do this? What do you want me to do? How can I defer to you? And then ask questions and listen and learn, see what they have to give. So our role is listening and learning, which goes all the way back to where we started. We moved on to this campus. Before we did anything in our community, we just spent some time listening and learning. So as we partner with City Fields, all our partnerships are gonna get better, they're gonna be enhanced as we really return to who we are and they teach us what it means to truly come alongside people rather than completing projects. Because here's how we serve. We serve through partnerships, building reciprocal generosity, and fueled, <laughs> fueled. I lost my train of thought by listening and learning. There we go. So here's the thing. Maybe you're here and you don't follow Jesus if you've heard about how Jesus left heaven and came here, and maybe you walked in going, man, I've always wanted to serve in this way. I just didn't realize that was the Jesus way. And you wanna follow him. And that's because he's been drawing you to him the whole way. So our prayer team's gonna be in the back. We'd love to have a conversation with you about what it means to follow Jesus. And for all of us, as public worship comes up, I just wanna challenge us, encourage us. Let, let's get out our calendars. Let's see if we could go ahead and pick a date that we could go listen and learn at City Fields and... Let's look for those opportunities today. Let's look for opportunities today and tomorrow where we might have in the past rolled in with our great idea and with the serve a little bit of arrogance. And let's enter into a partnership with people. Maybe it just starts by the simple discipline of listening and learning before we speak and start advising. So Jesus, you're incredible. I thank you so much for this mindset that, that you use Paul to lay out so clearly. I thank you for showing us how we can live out James 2 with James 3 and with Galatians 5, and you just tie it all in together. And so I pray that you would just begin to change me and change us. There's so much arrogance in my heart. I pray that you would just change me slowly. We're in a five-year thing because it's gonna take a while for you to work on this. So would you just begin that work today? Make us where we serve with your mindset, Jesus.